Hello everyone, Dr. Polaris here. During the Carboniferous period, the tetrapods began to come into their own, evolving from a lineage of lobe-finned sarcopterygians that became increasingly adapted for life on land. Early tetrapods inhabited a time and world very distant from our own. The majority of Earth's land masses were conjoined in an early iteration of Pangaea, with North America and Europe lying near to the equator while Africa, South America and Australia were positioned closer to the South Pole. Most of the more northern lands were covered with tropical swampy forests composed of towering club mosses and horsetails. These environments, similar to the modern Florida Everglades, encompassed almost the entirety of Europe, North America and Asia, being so extensive that the mineralized remains of fallen trees provided the basis for future coal deposits. This was a world dominated by huge arthropods, which took advantage of the significantly higher levels of oxygen in the atmosphere, and a variety of tetrapod lineages, most of which were either semi-aquatic or relied on returning to the water to lay their eggs, much as living amphibians do. However, during the second half of the Carboniferous, certain tetrapods became increasingly adapted for life away from rivers and lakes. A major group of these were the amniotes, animals that had evolved the ability to lay harder shelled eggs that retained moisture within, eliminating the need to spawn in water sources. The amniote egg allowed for the development of keratinized scales and claws, as well as giving these creatures the ability to inhabit more arid environments. Towards the end of the Carboniferous, the climate began to become significantly cooler and drier, causing the humid swamp forest to recede, to be replaced by more open and barren environments. These climatic changes were a disaster for the giant arthropods, but proved a boon for the early amniotes, which had already diversified into two major lineages, the sauropsids and the subject of today's video, the synapsids. The majority of these animals would have resembled small lizards, and were fairly minor components of their ecosystems in the Carboniferous. The sauropsids were ancestral to the later lepidosaurs, archosaurs, turtles, and many, many additional forms that we would consider to be reptiles, while the synapsids include the very earliest ancestors of mammals. However, at this stage, both lineages would have appeared outwardly very similar. The real differences were internal, and included a number of anatomical traits. Chief among these was the presence of a single opening at the rear of the skull, behind each eye, known as a temporal fenestra. Synapsids possessed one fenestra that possibly developed as an attachment site for powerful jaw muscles, while in later sauropsids, two fenestrae were present instead. In addition, synapsids were characterised by the presence of increasingly heterodont teeth. Basal forms could possess up to three canine-like teeth in the upper jaw, while more derived forms settled to a pattern of just one canine in each upper jaw half, a trait still found in humans today. As synapsids evolved, they also either lost or reduced the multiple bones of the jaw to be replaced by the single tooth-bearing dentaries present in modern mammals. Remnants of the articular and quadrate bones, still part of the jaw in reptiles, have become segments of the middle ear in mammals. In addition, synapsids appear to have possessed elevated metabolisms from an early date, with remains of the late Carboniferous and early Permian genus Ophiacodon showing the presence of fibrolamellar bone, suggesting at least partial endothermy. Although exactly when the development of typically mammalian traits, such as hair and lactation first occurred, is still unknown, Permian-aged coprolites from Russia do contain hair samples. This suggests that at least some of the more derived synapsids within Therapsida had hairy coats, while females possibly laid monotreme-like eggs. The most basal group of synapsids that can definitively be placed in this order are the Cassisaurians. These were superficially lizard-like animals that can be sorted into two main families. The first and more basal were the Eothyridids, a lineage of insectivorous and omnivorous forms that tended to be less than one meter or three feet long. Although three genera can confidently be assigned to this group, all of which were early Permian in age, a potential late Carboniferous member, Asifestera, might also belong here as well. Discovered at the Joggins fossil site in Nova Scotia, Canada, and dated to roughly 318 to 14 million years ago, this animal was originally classified as a Microsaurian Lepospondyl, but was reinterpreted as the oldest known synapsid ever found by a study in 2020. 
Regardless, the most well-known Eothyridid was the genus Eothyris itself, which lived in what is now Texas during the early Permian between 290 and 279 million years ago. Only the skull is known, which measured just 6 centimetres or 2.4 inches long, with the total estimated length of the animal being in the region of 30 centimetres or 12 inches. In form, the skull was short, blunt, and quite wide, with the presence of three canine-like teeth at the tip of the upper jaw being notable. The remainder of the teeth was small and sharp, while the snout possessed a distinctive and goofy-looking overbite. Eothyris was clearly an insectivore or carnivore, but we can't determine that much about its lifestyle, given that we lack any postcranial material. Along with the close relative Eodaleops, Eothyris probably resembled the common ancestor of all synapsids, being a relatively large-headed, barrel-bodied, lizard-like animal. The same cannot be said for the sister group to the Eothyridids, the Cassiids. Although originating as small carnivorous animals from the late Carboniferous, after the climatic aridification going into the Permian, Cassiids developed increasingly large body sizes and shifted towards herbivorous diets. In fact, these bulky and incredibly silly-looking synapsids were the largest early amniotes, as well as the largest terrestrial animals of the early Permian. All Cassiids, whether modest or enormous, are characterised by small cervical vertebrae, bulky barrel-shaped bodies, and comparatively tiny skulls. The oldest and most basal member of the group was the genus Eocassia, a 20 centimetre or roughly 8 inch long form that remained carnivorous and lacked many of the adaptations suggestive of herbivory that appeared in later genera. This suggests that the Cassiids were among the first tetrapods to shift from a carnivorous to herbivorous ecological niche. The most basal of the herbivorous forms were genera such as Cassia, a somewhat green iguana-like animal that measured up to 1.2 metres or 4 feet long. Native to the US southwest from the late Carboniferous to middle Permian, Cassia was a tubby herbivore with stout limbs and a tiny skull that fed on low-growing vegetation. In life, this animal lived alongside the carnivorous Dimetrodon and would likely have been preyed upon by it. Later Cassiids were substantially larger, with the most massive being the pin-headed Cotylorhynchus of middle Permian North America. This was a heavily built animal with a disproportionately small head and a huge tubby body, while the smaller species, C. romeri, only grew to lengths of 4.5 to 4.8 metres, or a maximum of 15.7 feet. Larger species, such as C. hancocci, stretched 6 metres or 20 feet long, making it one of the largest synapsids of the early Permian. They also featured a large parietal eye, and the snout or upper jaw that overhung the row of teeth and formed a protecting rostrum. The forelimbs and pectoral girdle were massive, with proportionally wide feet that may have been adapted for a semi-aquatic lifestyle. Escaping into bodies of water may have been the best response when faced with large therapsid predators, as these sluggish herbivores lacked many means of defence apart from their size. Despite their comical appearance, Cassiids were clearly successful animals that thrived as among the first large-bodied terrestrial amniotes. Persisting for roughly 40 million years, Cassiids were eventually replaced during the Middle Permian by more derived herbivorous synapsids such as the Estomenosuchids and Dicynodonts. Following on from Cassisauria are a pair of more derived families. These were the Ophiacodontids and the Varanopids. Both originated in the late Carboniferous and thrived in the early Permian, although it has recently been proposed that the Varanopids may be more closely related to diapsid reptiles instead. Both groups were initially small, lizard-like animals that skittered about on the swampy forest floors of Carboniferous forests, and were among the most ancient of all synapsids. Archaeothyrus was the oldest Ophiacodontid and was native to Nova Scotia roughly 306 million years ago. A carnivorous animal that measured 30 centimetres or about 12 inches long, Archaeothyrus would have been difficult to distinguish from the sauropsid reptiles with which it shared its environment, if you were to see them all together in life. However, the presence of a single opening behind each eye socket and a pair of canines in the upper jaw demonstrate the synaptid identity of this genus. Just before the Carboniferous rainforest collapse and the spread of more arid environmental conditions, Ophiacodontids expanded greatly in terms of size. The genus Ophiacodon, native to what is now Europe and North America, 
was a significantly larger animal, measuring up to 3 meters or 10 feet long, and weighing up to 500 pounds. A powerful predator, Ophiacodon possessed a deep, robust skull lined with small, sharp teeth, allowing it to prey on the contemporary Cassisaurians. Skeletons of Ophiacodon show a fast growth pattern with fibrolamellar bone, suggesting at least partial warm-bloodedness. This feature is not found in sauropsid reptiles present at the same time, and may indicate a reason as to why synapsids became the dominant terrestrial animals of the Permian. Given the disputed origins of the Veronopids, I'll leave them for a future video on early sauropsid reptiles. Regardless, synapsids thrived as the world became drier and more arid, with cassisaurs and ophiacodontids gradually being replaced by more derived forms. By the Middle Permian, both of these basal groups had become extinct, supplanted by a series of increasingly mammal-like forms. But that is a story for another time. Thanks for watching, everyone. The next episode will cover the early sauropsids that often lived alongside the first synapsids in the late Carboniferous. See you again soon. Cheerio.